Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. I am your host, Rob Port. A little bit later, uh, State Representative Shannon Roars Jones, who you'll be familiar with. She's been uh, my guest a few times on this podcast. She has been working to, to champion uh, marijuana decriminalization in the state legislature this session. It's been a rocky road. Her original bill was killed, uh, but they were able to bring the language back as an amendment to another Department of Corrections bill, uh, and they're fighting it. But now there has been a, an amendment in a conference committee, and what was a decriminalization effort has now turned into legislation which would actually increase penalties on marijuana, which you'll you'll hear Representative Horace Jones and I uh, discuss that. I don't know that. I, I think there's probably a lot of people out there who don't want to necessarily reduce penalties for marijuana. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who do want to reduce penalties to one degree or another. I think the number of people who want to raise penalties for marijuana is probably very, very small. And I'm wondering which constituency the lawmakers who are uh, behind this effort to raise penalties for marijuana. I wonder, well, I wonder who they're working for. But before we get to that, I want to talk for a moment about priorities in higher education. Now, I, I talk a lot about higher education. I think it's, I think it's hugely important for one reason, for all the reasons that you would think. I mean, we need to educate our workforce. We need to educate our kids. The research our universities do, uh, they, they increase the light of human knowledge. I mean, Education is wonderful. Higher education is wonderful. But sometimes our priorities in higher education and the, the public policy around higher education, well, it it stinks a little bit. Now, the legislature has been, well, they're, they seem poised to pass legislation that would fund a facility called Dunbar Hall. It's a chemistry lab building on the North Dakota State University campus. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. It's a little bit of a local issue, but I, I, I think the issue around Dunbar Hall maybe illustrates a larger problem. Even if you don't live near NDSU, if you don't care about NDSU at all, uh, if you're listening to this, I think the priorities on display at NDSU and around this debate on Dunbar Hall are important in, in that they're indicative of our overall priorities when it comes to higher education. Now, First of all, let me set this up for you. Dunbar Dunbar Hall has had problems for a long time. Um, I did some Googling back in 2014. The Associated Press was reporting that people who work in the building had to lug water because the pipes don't work. Can you imagine working in a chemistry building in a chemistry lab where you don't have running water? In June 2017, fire inspectors found significant safety violations in the building. Later that year, in December of 2017, the building literally caught fire. I was reading a report in the NDSU Spectrum. That's the the campus newspaper at NDSU. Um, They quote Greg Cook. He's the chairman of the chemistry department. He said, I quote, "Uh, for 20 years, we've had metallic dust particles blowing out of ventilation, covering our labs for 20 years. Can you imagine that? You're working in a lab, running water is a problem, fire safety is a problem. This is a chemistry lab. Metal dust is all over anywhere. I mean, that's not healthy. That's not good. How can you learn in an environment like that? Why are we doing that for our stu- to our students? Now, we can, we can talk, we can have a debate about why it's taken so long to get funding for Dunbar Hall. You know, is it the NDSU administration's fault? Is it the legislature's fault? I suspect there's probably enough blame to go around. But what's happening in the legislature, the House Senate uh, Conference Committee has agreed to a 40 million, a bill uh, which would give $40 million in bonding authority for Dunbar Hall, uh, provide $8 million in cold hard cash to fix the uh, facility, uh, and would also authorize NDSU to raise $3.2 million for Dunbar Hall. Sounds good. Maybe we can finally get this place fixed, and the chemistry students and the faculty who work there could have a better environment. That would be a good thing. But something a, a Republican state lawmaker from Fargo said, and I think he's right, but something that he said about it really opened my eyes. This is what my colleague, John Hageman, former news service reporter, John Hageman uh, r- reports. He writes, West Fargo Republican Michael Howe has warned that it wasn't feasible to raise that much money for a general education building. Now, again, if you'll remember, out of the numbers I just read, we're talking about of, of a total $51.2 million package. We're talking about authorization to fundraise from private donors, alumni, all the traditional people who donate to a university. 
raising $3.2 million for the chemistry lab. Howe says it's, it's probably not feasible to raise that much money for a general education building. You know what? I, I think he's probably right. That probably is a heavy lift for a general education building. But that's also kind of pathetic because let me give you some perspective. Less than a year ago, and I'm, I'm getting this information from a press release on the NDSU Athletic Department website. Less than a year ago, NDSU Athletics began a campaign to raise $37.2 million for a new football practice facility at NDSU. $37.2 million. And by all accounts, everybody thinks, you know, that's going successfully. It's going swimmingly. I don't know where they're at in terms of fundraising, but clearly plenty of people thought $37.2 million is a feasible amount of money to raise for a football practice facility. So let's go back. $3.2 million isn't feasible for an academic facility, a chemistry lab building. But $37.2 million for a football practice facility, well, that's entirely possible. On the uh, In the NDSU Athletic Department press release that went out, uh, Athletic Director Matt Larson said, I quote, one thing that has separated Bison Athletics from other institutions across the nation is our relentless commitment to excellence. If only we were as relentlessly committed to excellence in academics and things like chemistry as we are in football. To me, what this illustrates are some tragically poor priorities. The fundraising networks which support NDSU are clearly very interested in football, as evidenced by the fact that the athletic department can go out and find $37.2 million for a practice facility, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's all sorts of money that go out there. These football players, you know, they travel in style, they go around, uh, they have brand new equipment, they're attended to by a regiment of coaches and trainers and staff and everything else. There's a whole media department around the football program. I mean, it's big money. And I'll tell you that the football program doesn't make money. It doesn't generate revenue for the university. It costs the university revenue. Students and taxpayers have to subsidize the football program. And alumni, even even with alumni donations, even with all the fundraising that goes into the sports program, it still doesn't make money. It's a burden on the university's resources. According to data released by the NCAA, which accounts for information like ticket sales and merchandise sales and everything. I think a lot of people don't understand that. Every time I trot that out, there's somebody out there saying, oh, well, that can't possibly be true. Well, I don't know what to tell you. Unless unless NDSU is lying about what they're reporting to the NCAA, the football program doesn't cash flow. Even with alumni donations. There's all sorts of money that's thrown at football. But we can't even find a, a pittance, a fraction of what private donors throw at football and other sports programs at NDSU. We can't even find a fraction of that for a chemistry lab. Does that not speak to some awful priorities in higher education? I mean, think about it. Why were institutions like NDSU created in the first place? Why, why did, why did we go out and NDSU was a land grant university? Why did we start the land grant universities? Was it so that kids would have a place to play football? Was it so that football fans would have a team, a local team to root for? Was that the purpose? Because I'm pretty sure it wasn't. I'm pretty sure these universities were founded to promote education. They were founded to promote research. And yet when it comes to supporting that, there's plenty of reason for football, which is not the mission of NDSU, but there's not nearly so much money for chemistry, which is squarely in the mission of NDSU. Again, we talk a lot about problems in higher education and why it's so expensive and on and on and on. And well, I think our priorities are a big part of that, don't you? My interview with Shannon Norris Jones up next. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. Joining me now is State Representative Shannon Roars jones She's a Republican from Fargo and has been fighting this legislative session in Bismarck for 
marijuana decriminalization. Now, you all remember during the 2018 election cycle, a ballot measure to legalize, legalize, that's distinct from decriminalize, legalize recreational marijuana failed. So the decriminalization effort is, is, a push to find some common ground to say, okay, well, we're not going to do full on legalization, but maybe we can look at uh, having, you know, some of the consequences for using marijuana recreationally be less. Now, uh, that legislation failed earlier this session, but we're at that point in the session, Shannon, where everything's a little fluid, right? It seems like all the bills that are still standing are in conference committee, and from one moment to the next, things can change. Um, th- there is an effort to reduce penalties. But you're saying that you're disappointed by the compromise. You're disappointed by what's coming out. Tell us what's what's going on. Sure, absolutely. So, Rob, um, like you were saying, the original decriminalization of marijuana bill that started out as 1155 was defeated, and that is dead. But I had another bill that was related to drug paraphernalia and the Department of Corrections, which is House Bill 1050. Uh, and when that was in the Senate a couple of weeks ago, we put a floor amendment on that bill that would add um, a, a reduced uh, set of decriminalization. It would make um, possession of under a half ounce a fine only penalty of $250. It would make anything over a half ounce a Class B misdemeanor, which is the status quo. That's the current law for all quantities of marijuana is currently a Class B misdemeanor. And then it would make Um, ingestion and paraphernalia also find only non-criminal offenses. Uh, The Senate uh, passed that, and because that was different than what we passed in the House, it's gone to conference committee, and the membership of the conference committee came out yesterday with some new amendments that uh, went back to what was originally um, kind of the Senate Judiciary's recommendation, which actually increases the penalty levels for possession. Uh, They made it an infraction to possess up to a half ounce, which is the lowest level criminal penalty. So we're not talking about any level of decriminalization. Uh, Then they made between one half and one ounce a class B misdemeanor, which is, like I said, the status quo, that's current law. And then, but then they, they took it two steps further and said between one ounce and one half pound, that's going to be a class A misdemeanor, which is punishable by up to a year in jail. And anything over a half pound is a class C felony. Uh, which is punishable by up to five years in jail. And so they're actually increasing the penalty uh, for possessing marijuana, anything over one ounce of marijuana. Why, uh, I mean, why are you disappointed in this? I mean, explain that first, because I'm, I'm reading um, uh, uh, your, your quotes in a John Hageman article. My colleague, uh, former news service reporter, John Hageman, uh, he quotes you as saying, it is absolutely not decriminalization. Expand on that. Why, why the disappointment? Okay, well, I mean, the the first obvious part where it's absolutely not decriminalization is um, each one of these charges, infraction, misdemeanor, felony, is going to create for someone a criminal record that's going to impact them well into the future as far as their ability to find jobs, find housing, things like that. And that's the whole point of what I was trying to do is take small amounts of marijuana and create a non-criminal fine only offense similar to a traffic offense where if you get caught with a small amount and obviously we're not talking about distribution um, but where you get caught with a small amount you could be charged with a fine but it's not going to create that lasting uh, criminal record that affects you for years into the future Um, one of the things about the the idea of decriminalization came like you said through this whole push for measure three for full legalization a lot of the people who I talked to during the Measure 3 debates um, where I was debating against David Owen, who was the kind of the major proponent of legalization, is people would say to me, I don't use marijuana. I don't have any intention of using marijuana, but I'm going to vote for Measure 3 because I'm tired of people having their lives ruined by being caught with a small amount of marijuana. And so I looked at decriminalization as this fine only for a small quantity as a perfect compromise between, you know, we're not legalizing it. We're not saying it's okay for you to have it and possess it, but we're also not saying that we want to create a criminal record that affects you for years in the future. It seems to me the people who are uh, generally in favor of, you know, loose, uh, loosening our, our marijuana laws to one degree or another, there are two primary objectives there. 
Um, the first is the idea that there's this black market for marijuana and it's just, it's a bunch of criminals that are, that are selling it. And so if we make marijuana legal and we bring it into the daylight, we can take business and revenue and profits away from violent criminal people. That's one part of it. The other part of it, and I think this is where decriminalization comes in, is the idea that marijuana, whether you like it or not, has come to be a lot more socially acceptable. And in a lot of ways, I think we understand that, you know, people are using this drug. And so we're let's make it less serious. Let's not make it like uh, something equivalent to getting busted with with methamphetamine. This is something if you get caught with a with a joint somewhere. uh, okay, you're going to pay a fine, but it's not going to create a record. People aren't going to be able to go back and look. Oh, look, he got busted with a joint five years ago. Now, maybe I don't want to rent to him or give him a job or whatever the case may be. So I'm looking at, I mean, that's the goal of decriminalization. Agree with it or disagree with it. So I'm looking at this amendment or that, uh, or this compromise, I guess. And and Representative Kim Koppelman, um, one of your colleagues, Republican from West Fargo, he's calling the amended bill a happy medium because the legislature clearly is addressing this issue. I don't think that they are, Shannon, because if, if you're still creating that criminal record, then what's the point of any of this? Okay, okay, maybe the fines are a little bit lower, but the whole point of it is let's not be marking people with a scarlet letter because they got caught with a doob a few years ago. Right, exactly. And honestly, I don't look at it as a happy medium at all, first of all, because it doesn't, there's no part of this that is decriminalization. And I think that's what the members of the conference committee are, are satisfied with. They, you know, they think that, that moving from a class B misdemeanor to an infraction is enough of a step. Um, even if it still creates that criminal record, my opinion is that it's not enough of a step. And I don't know that I'm going to overcome that hurdle this legislative session. But the, the fact that they've actually gone 180 degrees the other direction and increased the penalties for possession of anything over one ounce, which is not a significant amount of drugs. Wait a minute. Um, now, I, I want to yeah. make sure that I'm understanding because this is all getting, like I said, we're at that point in the legislative session where things are very fluid and things are changing. Are you saying mm-hmm. that this this bill that has come out of the conference committee increases penalties over the status quo, over what's in law now or what was in the original bill? Over the status quo, what over what the law is right now. So we're going, the this This takes law, us backwards. I mean, this isn't, this, 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 we're literally going in the other direction. It, it, that's exactly what it's doing. It's um, right now, possession of any quantity of marijuana outside of the school zone is a class B misdemeanor. If you have larger quantities, they might charge you under distribution. But possession, simple possession of any quantity of marijuana is a class B misdemeanor. And so now not only do we have the infraction for less than a half ounce, we have the class B misdemeanor for one half ounce to one ounce, but anything over an ounce is either going to be an A misdemeanor or a C felony. Uh, I'm a little speechless uh, at that. And again, I, I, I feel like you look at the way the voters have been voting. Yes, they voted down recreational marijuana, but they voted for medical marijuana. I think there's an appetite out there for 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 maybe not maybe not full on re- legalization of recreational but at the very least let's start treating marijuana differently let's start you know let's start backing down a little bit i don't think there's that but i don't think that there's there's anything approaching a majority in the public that's saying let's get tougher on marijuana i don't know that that's i i i think it's out there i don't think there's anything approaching a majority i don't understand what's what's happening with that shannon that just seems bizarre to me um, I, I can't help but agree with you, Rob. This, uh, the fact that we are taking this and increasing the penalties, especially in what, what I would call this session and last session, we've really had a climate of justice reinvestment. A lot of the bills that I have put forward yeah. related to criminal record sealing and other things. We, um, actually, we had a, a bill that I carried to the floor on Tuesday. Uh, Chairman Compliman got up concerned that we might have inadvertently raised one of the penalty levels related to assault um, that we might have inadvertently raised. And so we took that. Um, it, it, the bill was correct the way that it was coming to the floor. But because of that concern that we might have inadvertently raised one of the penalty levels there, we took it back to the conference committee and reviewed it and ultimately sent it back because there was no increase in the penalty level. And now we have Chairman Compliment coming on this other bill saying, 
um, no, we need to increase the penalty levels for people possessing more than one ounce of marijuana. Well, I, I mean, I, it, that's just, it's frustrating. Tell me, where, where, where are we going with this now? I mean, this is out of conference committee. Obviously, the chambers have to agree to, to, to this change. What, what, what happens from here, Shannon? So, um, either I, I think it will be this afternoon. Um, we will have the conference committee will deliver their report to the House floor, and then the House floor will vote to approve or reject the conference committee report. My goal will be to get up during that and ask the uh, the floor to reject the conference committee report. And if that is the case, then it would go back to the conference committee to further amend the bill. Um, and so my goal there would be that they would take off the increased penalty levels, the Class A misdemeanor and the Class C felony. Um, of course, I'm still going to suggest that they should move the lowest level to a fine only rather than an infraction. I don't think I'll have any success with that. Um, and so my, I guess my, my expectation is that maybe we could get this passed out with the lowest level being an infraction and everything else being a Class B misdemeanor, which is the current status of the law. Well, I, I would think that if, if, if you can't kill these amendments, it would be better to just kill this bill uh, because this Absolutely. this would take us in the in the wrong direction. Well, good luck with that, Shannon, and appreciate you taking the time from from the floor of the House. <laughs> You're calling me uh, from the yeah. uh, from the House floor. Um, but I, I wanted to get you on because, uh, again, this is a very fluid situation. But I, I'm just I am surprised because I'm. I, I think every polit- every indicator out there is that a majority, a, a pretty strong majority of North Dakotans, we can disagree on on the the scope, we can disagree on the degree, but I think generally we want to move us in a direction where marijuana is a less serious offense, not a more serious offense. I I, I would agree with you. I think that the sentiment of the you know the general populace of North Dakota is that. We don't want to be increasing criminal penalties. You know, yeah. there there's plenty of people who don't think we should reduce them, but I don't think there's hard, there's you know anyone who thinks we should make them Increase. make them tighter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Shannon, thanks for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it, Rob. Well, that's it for today's Plain Talk podcast. If you want, you can rate or review this podcast on the service you're listening to, iTunes or Stitcher or what have you. Every rating, every review, every subscription to this podcast helps other people find it. So if you want to support the podcast in a small way, leave an honest rating, an honest review, subscribe to the podcast, tell your friends to subscribe, talk about it on social media. It all helps. If you have any feedback on the show, you can email Rob at sayanythingblog.com. That includes questions for our weekly guests, Senator Kevin Kramer, Congressman Armstrong, uh, Co- Congressman Kelly Armstrong. Uh, Senator uh, Kramer hasn't been on for a couple weeks. He'll be on again starting next week. Uh, we just had some scheduling issues the last couple weeks, but uh, we'll be back to that soon enough. But in the meantime, Congressman Armstrong, of course, is still on every week, uh, and you can send your questions for him to rob at sayanythingblog.com. Follow me on social media. I'm easy to find on Facebook. Just search for Rob Port or Say Anything Blog. Uh, same with Twitter. I'm at Rob Port on Twitter, at Say Anything Blog on Twitter. Uh, the blog platforms on Facebook and Twitter, that's the place to go if you just want the columns and the podcasts and the, the blog posts. Uh, if you want more of my personal type stuff, well, subscribe to my personal feeds. Thanks for listening. We'll talk again.